Chapter 3 Major Toot Dumpty Dum was typically a lights out, go to bed at sundown sort of kingdom. Very few villages were lively enough to have late night parties, or all night establishments. By and large, the people were simple, quiet folk, who enjoyed each other's company as long as the sun was up, and were more than content to curl up in a chair with a book when night fell on the land. Yes, everyone knew everyone, got along well with everyone, and had each other's back through thick and thin. Chair Ut spun around, since he was, naturally, running ahead of everyone, and grabbed his companions, pulling them to the ground. A low whoosh followed as a wooden chair sailed over their heads and cracked on impact. What in the world? Chumpty looked up to see a pair of villagers circling each other like lions about to spar. Hey, he shouted, mustering up all the power his voice could project. In the name of the king, stop this at once. To his surprise, they obeyed, turning their angry eyes toward him. What they didn't do, however, was shake hands and go back to their homes. Instead they turned toward the trio and started walking their way. Betty was first to her feet. Uh, chumps. Isn't this about the time when Will the bodyguard would jump out of a bush or something? He can't. He's on vacation, Chumpty replied gravely. The others looked at him, hoping he was joking. He's somewhere called Bermuda. Of the two men approaching, the one on Chumpty's left was the scarier looking by a mile. He walked with a limp, likely on account of too much brawling already, but seemed ready for more all the same. The other seemed much less wounded, though he moved slower. A moment later, it was clear why, he was intentionally hanging back to let the other man step in front. As soon as he did whammo with the chair -o. where the other chair came from, no one could say. Either way, the limping man went down for the count and the champion stood over his body, raising his arms in victory. Then Betty clocked him with her cane. Hey! He whimpered, stumbling backward and falling to the ground. His eyes glistened as tears welled up. What would you have to go and do that for? Shame on you for hitting a man in the back. Well you hit me in the stomach. What's the difference? Chumpty jumped between them. What's going on here? As he looked around the village, he could see similar skirmishes breaking out in all directions. One old lady had a frying pan in each hand, clapping them together like she was playing cymbals in the band, chasing away her elderly neighbor. Everyone's at each other's throats, Art observed. It's like Betty's house during Festivus. Hey, Betty snapped, sticking a finger in Art's face. That was said in confidence. Why were you two fighting? Chumpty asked the wounded man, sitting on the ground. He was still whimpering from Betty's stiff clubbing. I don't even remember. It was fine this afternoon and then. Then at night you felt really angry, Chumpty said, finishing the thought. A theory was forming in his mind but he didn't have all the answers yet. Sort of, it didn't happen right away. It just. Did you see the stars? Art asked. The man glanced up at the sky, as though he hadn't noticed before that very moment how blank and empty it was up there. As soon as he looked, his eyes narrowed and face tightened. What do you think? That I'm blind? He barked, rising up to threaten Art. You think I don't know what's going on here? You do? Oh so now I'm dumb too, is that what you're saying? Uh, Betty. On it, Betty said, rearing back with her shepherd's staff. The man flinched and recoiled, seemingly snapping out of his rage. Sorry. Sorry. Oh man, I don't know what's going on tonight. Chumpty cautiously put a hand on the man's back and eased him away from the scene. Just go back to your home, okay? We'll take care of it. I surveyed the chaos around them. It reminds me of that one summer when the ice cream guy was supposed to pass through but got lost and ended up in Regieville. I've never seen you so angry. Betty remarked. Well, you know, he said, shrugging. If anyone's going to take a dairy shortage seriously. Yeah. Something's definitely up though, Art said, scratching his head. Just the opposite, I'd say, Betty replied. Nothing's up there except the moon, and when a cloud passes in front of it, there's nothing to see at all. Sounds like you're thinking the same as me, Shumpty said, rejoining them. For some reason, not having stars in the sky means bad attitudes. Betty nodded. If that's true, it's not just the village, or even the kingdom, 
the whole world is in danger. Art kept his head on a swivel, listening to the two of them discuss the seriousness of the situation. His stomach growled, cutting the discussion short. Sorry, I was thinking about ice cream. Come on, the road to the castle is this way. Sadly, Castle Town was just as raucous as the other villages they passed on the way. Something's not right here, Chumpty said as they entered the heart of the town. No kidding, Art retorted, every village and town's at each other's throats. No, look, they're not fighting each other. They're fighting, whoa. Betty's hook snagged his arm and pulled him back just in time, a beggar on horseback whizzed by, howling like a madman and laughing at the mayhem around him. Who are these guys? Chumpty asked angrily. Are these the same people we saw at the wishing well? A loud trumpet blast issued from the castle, bringing the riders to attention. Hurry up then! A beggar shouted to a handful of companions stomping on flowers. The Major will have your heads if you don't get information. Major? Chumpty looked to Betty, who was just as confused. No one bothered to look to Art, since being confused was his default state. Let's follow them, Betty whispered leading the way forward. They're going right for the castle, Chumpty observed, picking up the pace, worrying about his dad. The drawbridge was lowered and the trio slipped inside, where, forming up in three rows, dozens of beggars on horseback sat waiting to be addressed by the current occupant of the castle. It didn't take long to unravel the mystery, the castle's doors opened and out stepped a sharply dressed soldier, with a polished helmet on his head, and shiny boots on his feet. Under his arm was a long brass trumpet, which he snapped to his lips and belted a loud note to the delight of his troops. The castle is ours. The major shouted, again drawing huge cheers from the army before him. All we have to do now is hunker down and hold it for a month. After that, we'll get our reward. His voice trailed off as he caught sight of something odd. The lamplit courtyard was casting long shadows on the shrubbery that surrounded the border of the area. Hidden behind those shrubs were Chumpty, Betty, and Art, failing to keep still and causing the shadows to dance wildly. Bring them to me. The Major barked. Hands reached in and plucked the trio out, dragging them to the front of the assembled army. Remind me to ask Will, how he manages to keep so still when he does that, Art muttered. They were thrown down at the feet of the Major, who smiled fiendishly at them. Well well, it's not even our first night and already we have intruders. We're not intruders. This is my castle, Chumpty shouted, rising up to defy him. The Major was not intimidated. He hunched over to put his face an inch away from Chumpty's. Then how come I'm the one living in it? Where's my father? I don't think we've been properly introduced. I am Major Toot of the... As you might imagine, Art and Betty snickered at his name. Chumpty, however remained stone-faced, partially on account of his worry over his dad, and also because he knows what it's like to have a name people make fun of, and no matter how big a villain you may be, no one deserves having their name be made fun of. On the other hand, his name wasn't Major. That was his rank. So Major Toot is at least half funny, let's be real. Arrest them, roared Major Toot. Soldiers quickly seized the trio and dragged them away no doubt toward the prison house located near the castle, where the kingdom's most hardened criminals stayed as they awaited trial. That was not to be Chumpty's fate, however. As they reached the entrance to the castle's courtyard, a blur of white flashed in front of them, followed by a streak of gold. Beggars scrambled to flee, acting in a way hardly befitting a real military unit. A few of their bravest ones tried to fight the expert swordsmen, but they quickly regretted it. Soon, the beggars were hightailing it away from the castle, leaving Major Toot to blow his trumpet loudly as he chased after them. Chumpty, Betty, and Art turned around to thank their surprise savior, then nearly fell over in shock when they discovered who their rescuer was. Mother Goose? Chumpty gasped. End of chapter.